the Duino elegies. The eighth elegy by Ranu Maria Rilke, translated by Stephen Mitchell, dedicated to Rudolf Kastner. With all its eyes, the natural world looks out into the open. Only our eyes are turned backward and surround plant, animal, childlike traps as they emerge into their freedom. We know what is really out there only from the animal's gaze. For we take the very young child and force it around so that it sees objects, not the open which is so deep in animal spaces, free from death. We only can see death. The free animal has its decline in back of it forever and God in front. And when it moves, it moves already in eternity like a fountain. Never, not for a single day, do we have before us that pure space into which flowers endlessly open? Always there is world and never nowhere without the no, that pure, unseparated element, which one breathes without desire and endlessly knows. A child may wander there for hours, through the timeless stillness, may get lost in it and be shaken back. Or, Someone dies, and is it. For nearing death, one doesn't see death, but stares beyond, perhaps with an animal's vast gaze. Lovers, if the beloved were not there blocking the view, are close to it and marvel. As if, by some mistake, it opens for them behind each other, but neither can move past the other and it changes back to world. Forever turned toward objects, we see in them the mere reflection of the realm of freedom which we have dimmed. Or when some animal mutely, serenely looks us through and through, that is what fate means, to be opposite. To be opposite and nothing else, forever. If the animal moving toward us so securely in a different direction had our kind of consciousness, it would wrench us around and drag us along its path. But it feels its life as boundless, unfathomable, and without regard to its own condition, pure like its outward gaze. And where we see the future, it sees all time and itself within all time forever healed. Yet, in the alert warm animal there lies the pain and burden of an enormous sadness, for it too feels the presence of what often overwhelms us, a memory, as if the element we keep pressing toward was once more intimate, more true, and our communion infinitely tender. Here, all is distance. There, it was breath. After that first home, the second seems ambiguous and drafty. Oh, bliss of the tiny creature, which remains forever inside the womb that was its shelter. Joy of the gnat, which, still within, leaps up even at its marriage, for everything is warm. And look at the half-assurance of the bird, which knows both inner and outer, from its source, as if it were the soul of an Etruscan, flown out of a dead man, received inside a space. But, with his reclining image as the lid, 
and how bewildered is any womb-born creature that has to fly. As if terrified and fleeing from itself, it zigzags through the air, the way a crack runs through a teacup. So the bat quivers across the porcelain of evening, and we, spectators always everywhere, turn toward the world of objects, never outward. It fills us. We arrange it. It breaks down. We rearrange it, then break down ourselves. Who has twisted us around like this so that no matter what we do, we are in the posture of someone going away? Just as upon the Father's hill, which shows him his whole valley one last time, he turns, stops, lingers. So we live here, forever taking leave.